And welcome to this morning's cybersecurity webinar. Uh, my name is Alex Turner. I'm from the business desk and I'll be hosting uh, this discussion for the next 45 minutes. Uh, and it's a really timely uh, moment for us to have this, uh, this discussion and get into some of the detail around uh, cybersecurity and the threats uh, that the businesses face. Uh, there have been three pretty high profile examples in the last 10 days or so. Uh, the, there was the uh, civil servant who, who went rogue and tweeted that what the government statement had just said was arrogant and offensive, uh, which for 10 minutes was the official government line to a course of a million people on social media. Uh, there was the Financial Times journalist, or more accurately now, the former Financial Times journalist, Mark DiStefano, who was sacked for accessing an internal Zoom call from another newspaper that was talking about job cuts. Uh, and then there was EasyJet, uh, who in their words had a highly sophisticated cyber attack, which uh, exposed a lot of their customers details and, and meant that they had to do the very public and very apologetic uh, email to, to their customers saying, you know, we, we've, we've had, a, had an issue and this is what you need to do, which is you know, something that all companies, whether they're the size of EasyJet or, or much smaller, never, never like to do. We've got a, a great panel uh, with us this morning to talk through uh, some of those issues and what you as business owners and managers uh, should be doing and should be thinking about uh, in terms of how you protect your business. Uh, we've got uh, Sarah Tulip from EY, uh, Graham Peck from Leeds United, Henry Doyle from Alternet and Nick Deacon Elliott from Boxfish. So well, welcome all of you. In terms of the format this morning, so we, we've got this scheduled for 45 minutes. So uh, I said, I'll be hosting the discussion with our panelists, but there is a Q&A function uh, on Zoom. So uh, for those of you who have questions, just type them in uh, and I will look to weave them in as we go along uh, at the appropriate moment throughout the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, so without further ado, if I could turn to our, our panel and just ask each of you to very briefly introduce yourself and, and just perhaps say, you know, how you see the challenges uh, have changed over the last uh, few months. Sarah, can I start with you? Yeah, of course. Good morning. Um, so my name is Sarah Tulip. Um, I currently work as e at EY as uh, the digital director, heading up um, all things digital in the region for Yorkshire and the Northeast. So engaging with businesses um, from startup right through to uh, sort of larger mid-market organizations. Um, the reason I'm involved today is my background as well. So um, I've worked previously as a COO for a number of technology businesses. Um, and that includes, I guess, organizations where security was very, very key. So working, running a business called AQL, which is a, a telco and data center. So security was really the key of everything that we did there. Um, and I was responsible for the, the, the full security piece there. Um, also working, launching software products and, and software testing industry as well. So um, it's really been a big part of my background. I guess for me, one of the interesting things that's going on, and uh, we're talking about people um, and security at the moment, is maybe thinking about where our, our data is at the moment, that um, there's probably a lot of laptops all over the UK at the moment that normally would be based in an office and somewhere secure. And um, I don't know if a lot of businesses got time to encrypt all those laptops. So really at the moment, although we're thinking about hosting in the cloud and all our data being in one place, actually is our data spread all over the UK in people's homes and are we at more risk than ever? So that's just a thought that's going on in my mind. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, Graham. Yeah, hi, my name's Graham Peck. Um, I'm the Data Protection Officer or Data Security Manager here at uh, Leeds United Football Club. Um, uh, my background comes from originally in software development um, through until um, uh, more financial uh, businesses and um, data centers are now into sport. Um, very much focused around the technical aspects of, um, of data security. Uh, so, um, uh, one of the things that we've been looking at is, uh, like Sarah said, all the, all the laptops are out there, but also the levels of 
training um, that's available to all, all of the staff members because some people hear these acronyms like um, phishing and, and so forth, but do they actually really understand the concepts of um, uh, working from home or worst case scenario, working off of um, another Wi-Fi source that's unsecure? So things like uh, the benefits of a VPN and um, uh, and what effect it can have. Um, and lastly, was more around the shadow, what I classify as shadow IT. This concept of people now, yes, they, they've got laptops, but they're copying files to OneDrive, Dropboxes, various others, and you end up with a, a shadow IT of your existing, and how do you control that? And, that, and that's me. That's what I'm Great, doing. thank you, Graham. Yeah, definitely uh, important issues that we'll come on to. Uh, Nick? Hi, uh, morning everybody. So I'm uh, Nick Dicknellett, the VP of Operations at Boxfish. We're a cyber-based um, software company headquartered in Leeds. And the role that we play in the cyberspace really is working with businesses to um, help identify kind of the cyber risk within their people, within their uh, staff. So we give them a risk score. And then what we do is over a period of time is we essentially work with them to reduce that. And it's really about showing their end users and, uh, and their people what good looks like. Um, so I think the, the topic for, for me today really that I'm certainly interested in is um, there's been an enormous increase in volume, particularly people being targeted at an inbox level, so I think 500% over the last couple of months. So how do we sh uh, deal with the kind of spike in volume, but then really to extend to Graham's point, how do we show people what, what good looks like? So it's all good and well, so you need to behave um, in line with cyber best practice, but we've got to tell people what that looks like as well. So that's really the piece I'm here to cover today. Great, thank you. And Henry. Yeah, hi guys, good morning. Um, my name is Henry Doyle. I'm co-founder of Alternet. Um, we're a cyber security MSP based in Leeds. Um, we work with a vast range of clients um, across all sectors, one of them being um, Leeds United and Graham, um, to provide cyber security technology. So that can range from email security all the way through to, to endpoint. Um, and we've also got a relationship with Boxfish. Um, so we've got a relationship with Nick as well. Um, I think that the key thing for me that is shocking, to be honest, is the amount of fraudsters that are now leveraging COVID-19 to cause more harm and infiltrate companies' networks, but also individuals. I think we always think about B2B because that's our, our main role. But I think everyone on this webinar will know someone personally who's been affected by cybercrime, whether that's had um, their money taken from their bank account, they've, they've transferred Amazon vouchers to someone or um, had their PayPal hacked, um, just some, some examples, that it, it's, it's shocking, but it has to be actioned. Um, so Nick mentioned that cybercrime is up about 500% um, since March 23rd when lockdown started. Um, we can also go a bit further than that and actually say that 80% of cybercrime is currently leveraging COVID-19. Um, so if you think about the training that companies might have done eight months ago on cybersecurity, none of that will have incorporated COVID-19 and 80% of the threats are now leveraged around that. So it, I think the key thing that we need to discuss today is how we continuously train um, staff members, how we make sure our technology is um, up to scratch um, and how we're always looking for the, what are the relevant threats because threats are evolving all the time um, and we, we need to make sure we're, we're on top of that before um, our networks get infiltrated. Yeah and I think it was really interesting uh, watching on the government press conference the other day when uh, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer was asked how, how is somebody meant to tell that the call they get is a genuine one from the, uh, from the contact tracers and, and the answer being, oh, well, effectively, they'll sound credible uh, was quite horrifying from a, from a data security yeah. point of view. Uh, but before we move on to uh, kind of the, the willful uh, either misconduct or, or the danger of, of hackers who are approaching things in a very targeted way, let, let's just spend a, a little bit of time talking about the issues that can arrive from I suppose people being uh, naive or ignorant and, and, and not aware of, of the problems. And Graham, if I could start, start with you, you know, what are the challenges of, of having a team that are working from home, using their own devices, uh, don't have you know, the IT manager or the departmental manager 
sat at the desk behind them looking over their shoulder. You know, what, what challenges does that bring? Well, uh, a couple of things. One, um, uh, sometimes you'll find that staff will get a bit bored because normally they've been sitting there at a desk with their, with their computer and there's always somebody next to them or near them. So um, they're a bit more aware of what they've got on their screen. Now, obviously, that isn't the case. So um, what we find is um, putting in some good auditing measures so that you can say, A, that person only has rights to the files that they need to do their specific role. Um, unfortunately, in, in most businesses, sometimes you get what I classify as like a temporary store or a corporate drive, and there's no, um, no levels of security around it. And then when people are bored or they're sitting now in an area which is unattended, has perception of, of wanting to go and just have a look and nosy around, and people not realizing that people are putting other files in there that may be confidential or um, have some form of personal information in it that then other people are, are going around and snooping on. Um, other things that we normally find is um, uh, for, the, for the users themselves um, is uh, making sure that A, um, whatever it is that, um, that they're doing um, doesn't have an effect on anybody else. So if somebody's to be running some heavy reports or whatever the case is, that they communicate because again, they feel like they're slightly detached because they're working in isolation. And next month you've got three people running very large reports, bringing the systems down for a, a couple of other, a couple of other key individuals like websites or whatever the case is, can have an adverse effect. So it's, it's trying to explain to people they need to communicate more because they're now in this, state of isolation where normally they would reach uh, just say over the divide of the desk or whatever the case is oh, i'm going to be doing this is anybody working on that system so it's bringing that communication that collaboration back into into effect great and sarah so, so gray mentioned earlier as well about uh, the shadow it system so so to your point of where is our data how how, how do companies get a handle on that and, and, and get real control of of that question it's interesting you, you asked that because I was thinking about it and actually there's, um, there's probably even a little bit further with that. So at the moment, a lot of organisations, I think in some cities it's 40 percent of employees are furloughed at the moment. Um, and if you think that you've got maybe possibly, I don't know, 40% of your workforce at home furloughed um, and those people, if you're not treating them right at the moment, they might be disgruntled and you might have disgruntled employees with full access to your systems at the moment. So if you think about it, um, I don't know, you've got a finance team of six, three are furloughed, and they all still have full access to your banking systems, and you're not treating that person well at the moment, what are you opening the door to? So I feel personally that possibly this is a, a wider business piece where, you know, we are talking about cybersecurity and people. And I think when we talk about people, we talk about HR. And I think that you can't just go and say, you know what, we're going to turn off all the access for you guys because you're furloughed because you're opening the door then to bigger people problems um, mm. around organization and culture. So I think it's a, an opportunity to really have a look at your wider business goals. So look at the organization as a whole, understand you know, does somebody have a last pass that's furloughed at the moment with the logins to your website, your systems, your, you know, what, what controls are in place. I think it's a really good time to, to review that um, and, and take that as a, as a piece of work as an organization, but not just as cyber professionals, as looking at it from the people piece as well, because you could cause a lot of, lot more problems for your organization. So, uh, you know, some businesses are looking that they're gonna have to make a round of redundancies next. And if you've suddenly taken a, a access controls off everybody and then you start, you know, making redundancies, it feels that it's, it's quite a contrived thing as well. So I, I think from that perspective, and. I think also as well that we treat data differently so not just from a cyber perspective but you know when we're printing at home so I've only got one printer in my house and it's in my little boy's bedroom and sometimes I print something off and then he colors on the other side of it and then I don't have a system where I have you know a way to get rid of my information securely um, is it going to go in the wheelie bin outside because you know, it doesn't take a lot to find out who I am and where I live and the sort of organization I work for. 
Um, and I think that, you know, there has to be a, a real big piece at the moment. I think ISO uh, 27001 talks about remote working, um, although it is actually quite a small section. It does talk about that. And I think it's the time to really revisit really that, um, highlight it. Um, and, and really make sure that as businesses we're taking that seriously and following that policy. And Nick, you mentioned about uh, creating a risk score for individuals, effectively trying to identify uh, you know, wh where the problems might arise. How, how does that work and, and what sorts of factors make somebody uh, riskier? Yeah, so, so it's a good question. So, so what we do initially really is we'll work with businesses to run some simulated um, fish, predominantly phishing attacks um, on the end users and something that I think is really important to understand before I go too much further is that um, there is some business leaders have a perception that a simulated attack can feel a bit of an entrapment of its people but it's absolutely not that. What we're trying to do is get to your people and, and your, your staff and I suppose your, your biggest threat landscape before um, cyber criminals do. So we get there first, and then off the back of that, um, we're able to kind of, I suppose, find the needles in the haystack. So you may have 400 employees, and we can measure who's engaging with these uh, simulated attacks. We can take that data, we can really go and, and, and draw our attention to those individuals first. Um, and then what we'll do is obviously off the back of that, we show them what the good looks like. So did you check the links? Did you check the from address, not just the from name. Um, did you, it, worst case, if you weren't expecting it, did you pick up the phone and, and ring them and say, you know, did you share this file with me? I just want to check, or do I need to pay this invoice? So showing them what kind of good looks like. And then we'll run a series of maybe more sophisticated simulations to try and continually improve the, the awareness of, of attacks within your people. But it's really getting, getting to, your staff before cyber criminals do and then get people in the the mindset of i best just check this before i action it yeah. and henry you talked about the you know eight percent of, of cyber crime is leveraging covid19 at the moment and I suppose yeah. that that's really targeting kind of an individual's weakness or vulnerability uh you, you know I, th I think i think most people are aware that emails from nigerian princes probably aren't real but, yeah. but, but I mean, th this is effectively, you know, no, no different. How, how, how do you make sure that, that your, your teams and the companies that you work with mm. are, are able to protect themselves against, you know, the, the latest issues? Well, this, I guess there's, there's two sides to it. I think you've got to have the quality technology um, to protect your business. So whether that's email security, web security, endpoint security, if you have that, that security in place, the vendors that, whether it's Microsoft, Sophos, Barracuda, you'd have heard of all those vendors, they'll be providing patches to that technology on a regular basis. And their research and development teams, which are vast, are always looking at the latest threats and some of the stats I actually mentioned earlier from Barracuda. And what they're looking to do is, you know, find those threats as early as possible and then push that patch onto the technology that you're using. So if you've got email security, if you've got endpoint protection, et cetera, that will go a long way to helping um, you get protected. However, companies are already spending money on um, cybersecurity technology, and they have done for the last, for the last two generations and will continue to do so. What we've seen companies aren't willing to invest in or haven't been in the past is the staff element. And if you think that 90% of cyber threats now come via email, then we've got to be training the front line, which is the staff. Because actually, if we train the front line, less threats are going to get through to the technology. And what we've got to see is that technology be sitting there as the, the last line of um, sort of defense. Um, but since the emergence of Office 365, that's now called Microsoft Office 365, it's much easier for cyber force to, to, to enter people's inboxes. And what they're trying to do is get access to your email accounts. If they can get access to your email accounts, they can see all the emails and they can sit in your inbox, sometimes for months and wait to strike. Um, so for example, we had a, a client um, who, or before they were a client, the CFO um, had his Office 365 um, account taken over. So basically they, they were looking at it 
as he was looking at it. And he was sending some emails to a supplier about um, invoicing. And then they jumped in, sent an email from his email address to the supplier saying, we've changed our bank details. It doesn't matter what technology the supplier has got in place to prevent that email coming in. It, it, to any technology, that looks like a legitimate email. So the only thing we can do there is, is train staff to make sure they're not clicking on links that could be suspicious. They're not um, signing up to things online that um, means they have to download anything onto their, onto their laptop. So a big part of it is making sure that our workforce are, are savvy, um, but also making sure that we're training them on the relevant threats because we can go and train them on um, Microsoft Office 365 protection. But then when COVID-19 comes around, if we don't train them on the threats that come from COVID-19, then they could easily get um, caught out again. And, you know, we're not talking about, you know, the, the, the prints from Nigeria. What we're talking about is highly sophisticated emails that look very, very genuine, very genuine. And, you know, it's, it's more about, OK, if the language doesn't look right, we need to highlight that to IT. It's not necessarily just that it's really obvious that it's a, it's a phishing email. And I, I know people who work in IT that have been caught out. I've been caught out on one before. Luckily, the, the technology behind stopped it. Um, they're highly sophisticated and um, training is, is a massive part that, that we ha every business should be implementing. And the last thing I'd say is that it shouldn't just be, you know, organizations with 500 staff that are looking at this. If you've got one member of staff, two members of staff, all it takes is your email account to get taken over and they can have access to everything. Um, if you think how you communicate via email, the information that's on there, you know, it, it's scary. Yeah. And uh, Nick, I think this is one for you, a question for, from Gary that asks, uh, how regularly do you think uh, companies should conduct a phishing exercise? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. So we, I think the more regular, the better, but it's finding, you don't want to give people kind of fatigue at an inbox level. So um, we would usually suggest one a month um in that kind of region um but then the key off the back of it is that the training is not lengthy it has to be like a sprint approach so no more than 10 to 15 minutes a month but every month without fail there's gone on a day where you used to be able to do a two and a half hour annual conference um to your people and then oh we tick that box everyone's cyber aware we'll do it again in a year's time it just doesn't work people turn off after 10 15 minutes so the key is regular but small chunks and then it builds into that kind of rhythm of, of working and we, you know we, we've talked briefly there about uh, the danger of, of people from outside uh, coming in the, what what's the level of, of inside a threat where you know other people are just say reckless with the way they handle and, and data, whether it's uh, you know, pen drives or, or Google Drive and the like, uh, or equally those people who, who know what they're doing and do it doing it deliberately. How, how, how do businesses mitigate against those threats? Uh, Sarah, would you like to take that one? Um. Do you know what I think is hard at the moment? I think that, you know, the reason all this is going on and, and the, the huge rise in cyber, you know, attempts and crime is that people are scared and they're concerned and they're lost and they're distracted. Um, and so it's preying on people at their worst time. You know, business owners might be working, waiting on an email about a Siebel's loan. Um, you know, individuals might be waiting on the, the details of a personal loan that's going to bolster their family. Um, and I think that's the thing at the minute is with regards to people, you know, like cyber criminals pay, prey on the weak, people pay on the distracted, prey on the, so I, I think it, at the moment it, it's down to organisations to really think about this as almost as part of the like pastoral care for, you know, their employees, that it has to be part of the discussion um, and that it has to be part of business as usual now employees are are based at home and you know we talked to, I think it's Yorkshire Yorkshire Bank announced that 70 to 80 percent of their staff are going to be at home until further notice um, that I know that I'm going to be home based for the rest of this year so I think the, the key thing is that organizations are treating this as normal behavior that people are at home that people are going to use technology in a different way that they're you know people are roaming around the systems people are plugging things in people are clicking on emails 
And I think that organisations now, this has to be a priority and they treat it that they have a, a it, in a percentage of work from home workforce and what is their, you know, their policy procedures and how they're delivering that and supporting their employees. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, when you say that cybersecurity is a people problem, I think it's everybody's problem. And I mm. think, you know, from a, a, a business and organisational problem, if you own a business and something happens to your business, it's your reputation and it's your trust that goes with your clients and your customers. So uh, from my my thoughts as this is you need to be taking this seriously because, you know, mistakes made by employees because you haven't taken the time to train and develop them and make sure that they're aware of this could be the thing that brings down your organization. So from my perspective, it has to just be a, a core activity that's going on in the organization. Can I, can I just add one thing on to that so to, to embellish the point? I think... Um, there's a bit of a viewpoint that the, the cyber safety sits with IT with quite a lot of businesses and it absolutely doesn't. So it is a responsibility of everybody within the company. And I think part of the work that needs to be done is to address that, that actually people feel accountable for their behavior. And it's not, oh no, our IT director take care of cyber. No, no, it's you as an individual. But if the collective look after uh, the way they're working and individually behaving, then as a business, you're going to be in a much better place. Definitely always with the board issue for me. And I think if you're not talking about it at a board level, then you're not taking it seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Great, Graham. Leeds United is obviously a business that has a, a huge amount of personal data, whether it's the, kind of the, the ticket office database or the online store. Uh, you have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of uh, people's details. How, how do, and also, I suppose, a very high-profile organisation uh, you know, on, on, on a global level. How, how, how do you look to, to protect uh, the business from, from the external threats it could face? Oh. It's not hearing you at the moment, yeah, Greg. Well, um, uh, from a data perspective, one of the things that we do is... Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, coming through loud and clear, thanks. Are you able to hear me now? Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so first of all, what we do is we classify our data. So um, once we can understand and you've ordered your data as to what is sensitive and non-sensitive, then you can start looking at who has access to that data and again, do another audit around do they need access and what level of access and do they need access to all of the data or only some of the data? Um, and then making data owners, which then makes it a little bit easier to manage. So somebody's not just going along and um, giving rights to a database which then has personal information um, or sensitive information or even medical information like with regards to players or, or so forth. So um, the first big part is the audit side. From an external side, it's making sure your firewalls and your perimeter security, both external and internal. So it's two, two sides. So things like um, if people need access to certain areas, look at two-factor authentication so that it's not just a password. There's also either an authenticator app or mobile PIN number or some other form of access. So it's not just one, so it can't be spoofed. Um, uh, the other thing is making sure that patch management. So um, things like WSUS and various other things to make sure that uh, you're constantly stopping any vulnerabilities that there may be on your platforms from being, um, uh, from being penetrated from uh, uh, vulnerabilities uh, so, so it's looking at that, but um, I think the main thing is um, all around the classification of the data and saying, what can you print? What can't you print? What can you get access to remotely? What can't mm -hmm. you get access to remotely? So um, uh, I'll take Sarah's uh, point with regards to finance. Does everybody in finance need access to the payroll? Well, no, there may only be one or two people in finance that deal with payroll. Let's only give those people access to the areas that they require and not to fire finance in general. So somebody's not sitting in their mailbox 
trying to um, uh, wait for an int coming in or whatever the case is uh, to be able to spoof uh, by just auditing and making sure that those levels and people understand what they are able to access. And if they do need access to something else, they've got to pass it through their management and justify why they need access. It's not automatically given. I think that's the biggest, the, the biggest area that we concentrate on, especially because of the value of our data. No, that, that's great. Does that answer the question? It, it, it does. Thank you, Graham. And I'll, I'll just dip into some of the audience uh, questions now. Henry, if I could uh, point one in your direction. Uh, yeah. Somebody's asked how useful or helpful is Cyber Essentials Plus? Uh, mm -hmm. It's really useful. I think the, the difference between Cyber Essentials and Cyber Essentials Plus um, is, is significant. But if, you're, if you haven't got Cyber Essentials at all, I would suggest starting off with Cyber Essentials. What's that, what that's going to do for you is, is give you a base level um, checklist. Basically, it's a checklist that you go through. Um, you provide commentary of, of what security you've got in place. And it will help you identify gaps in your network or in your um, human shield um, so that's a really good starting point so if you haven't got cyber essentials at all I would massively suggest that um, every company should should have cyber essentials at least and then um, as you grow you can potentially look at cyber essentials plus but as a minimum every business should have cyber essentials um, we've got it as a bit we don't provide it but we've got we've got it as a business Boxfish has got it as a as a business as well I know um, and it's you know, it, it really does give you that base level and identifies the gaps and you, you can see it as a, as a research project. I think that's the best way to look at it is what it's not going to give you is any more security. What it is going to give you is, is highlight the gaps. And if you can go and fill those gaps, you'll get the, the accreditation. You'll see more and more um, customers ask for cyber essentials. They want to work with suppliers that are, have got cyber essentials, especially if you work with public sector organizations. Um, and from a cost perspective, um, you know, different companies offer it for, for different price, but between 300 and 400 pounds to, to get cyber to get the cyber essentials accreditation is, is about right. Um, and there's tons of companies online that um, can do it. And um, if anyone wants me to put them in touch with the guys that we use, I'm happy to do so. Great. And then we've got a couple of questions uh, from Andrew and Kieran uh, that go to the same point. So perhaps. Uh, Graham, if I could ask you this one, you know, where, where can people get regular uh, information about, you know, cybersecurity topics, about the latest threats? You know, how, how, how do people keep keep up to up to date with the issues? Uh, well, there's um, there's loads of different. Um, sections to do with security. I think one of the things uh, when I was looking at Kira's first question, which was about um, what could he read in that, um, I think one of the things is first is trying to understand what area of cyber security, because it is such a vast, wide knowledge base, is from penetration testing to risk analysis and auditing to the actual physical um, uh, uh, ethical hacking and so forth, um, that it's to try and define what it is that you're looking for, the area of um, or the topic that you're wanting to look for, and then going to go and have a look uh, in that specific section. Um, there is um, uh, various forums like uh, the Critical Ethical Hacking um, Forums. There's ones with regards to um, cybersecurity um, on the cybersecurity forums. Uh, you can also go and look at updated um, uh, feedbacks that are coming in on a lot of the major suppliers like Barracuda and so forth that have updates, um, live updates on or McAfee's and so forth on trains or uh, what is happening um, in real time. Um, that means that you can then go and have a look and see what is it that I can do to protect because there's now an emerging, uh, emerging ransomware, for example. So what is it targeting? Is there a patch that I need to apply to be able to get down, um, to be able to get all my systems up to date? Uh, I think the, the, the first thing is identifying what area of cybersecurity you're wanting to read because you're not going to find a one-stop shop, unfortunately. 
Yeah, and and Sarah, I know you're involved with. Uh, if we can think back to when we had in-person events, uh, but but in, in terms of uh, kind of digital set the networking uh, events, you know, how, how how useful is is that for for people and for businesses to to get involved in? You know, actually, what's interesting, a lot of people that I know who work in this space at the moment, um, specifically, it's really exciting because normally when you think about networking events, you um, stay in your region, don't you? You stay, you know, like you know there's maybe like a, I don't know, a, a security meetup in Leeds, but actually, they found that they've been going to meetups because they're online in Australia, in the US, in London, they've been meeting lots of experts and finding out lots of ways that different things and do things and it's really opened up a global platform with regards to where you can go and find out more about this topic so you don't really feel confined to, to you know to I don't know 30 minutes from your house so there is a global you know platform now go out and find more go and see what other people are doing understand what other countries you know other thought leaders are doing in the space because I, I think there's an opportunity to to really go out and learn so I, I think that's very exciting and also you know if you don't know anything there's nothing wrong with going to a meetup and, and, and putting your toe in the water and finding out a bit more for your organization um, there's also a book actually I was uh, told by my friend Gary Hibbert who's a, a security professional there's a fantastic book called Transformational Security Awareness by Perry Carpenter um, apparently absolutely fantastic read um, so um, I don't know if anybody else has picked up that book, but he's he's saying to Nick's me, got it next yeah. to him, I think, probably. Oh, well. yeah. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> fantastic book. Um, I haven't read it. I've been told to buy it. It's on my Amazon list. Um, but yeah, if people are looking for a read, I believe that that covers things quite quite a broad sense. Um, but you know, interestingly, a, a good way to to approach the the topic. Great. And uh, the question from Dawn, who, who uh, represents a, a charity, she's asked, uh, can we recommend any training uh, that can be accessed for staff? Uh, and she says, in yeah. particular, since COVID and, and Henry, what you raised around Office 365. So I mean, we so we do work with quite a few charities of, of multiple sizes, and that ranges from sort of 10 users all the way up to two and a half thousand users. And what we find with charities is that they actually do get targeted more than probably corporate businesses, which again is, is completely wrong, but it, it's just the stats prove that. Um, in terms of training that we, we provide, we provide different types. Obviously Nick's company, Boxfish, they do provide training and Nick also works, I know works with charities. So it's probably worth having a conversation with Nick. What we, they look to do initially is just find that risk score. So any time before, we do any training, whether it's through alternate or, or through box fish, what the common knowledge is always trying to identify what that risk score is. And the way we will do that is normally to send those out the simulations. Um, however, there is a few other ways we can do it um, as well. Um, and from a training perspective, um, what we're trying to do there is, is use learning management systems basically to provide training. So we're not trying to get everyone in a room and train people for half an hour. What we're trying to do is get people to watch three minute videos max we're trying to get people to do to do quizzes we're trying to get people to look at infographics twice a month and so we're actually asking for probably four minutes of each employee's time per month what we don't want to do is affect their day-to-day -day job because they won't do the training and you know we're talking about cyber security training but all the the other types of training whether it's hr we've got to look at learn lessons from that as well because you know i've done loads of hr training before sorry um health and safety training before and it's not massively enjoyable how do we make sure the staff understand the importance of it and then make sure the training isn't in, um, invasive um and by using a an online platform to do that especially when people are working from home it makes it super efficient and they can do it at a time that, that suits so to answer the question i'd probably have a, have a chat with with Nick um, because they can, they can be super flexible on the type of training they provide and do already work with quite a few charities. Great, thanks. And uh, Nick, we've got a question from David around other reasonable steps an employer can take to safeguard the exporting of confidential information? So taking the, so yeah, well, I think there's a major step is um, 
kind of the mindset of the employee. So are they happy? Are they in a good place? Or are they a bit disgruntled kind of to, to extend Sarah's point? And I think um, a good exit process when somebody leaves is really key. So making sure that um, their accounts are removed, they don't, can't get access to um, systems that you wouldn't want, you know, externally. So making sure that there's a really clear policy and checklist for what you do when people are kind of leaving the business is important. And then um, the other side of things is, is back to Graham's point earlier on, just setting up the right access control policies. So um, if you can't get, if, if you open it up to everybody, the problem's big. Whereas if you just give people the access to the data that they need to do their job, you're limiting that and um, reducing what can be exported as well. I think access control and a good uh, HR policy around levers is really key. Great. I'm conscious that, that uh, time is, is nearly up. So if I could ask uh, each of our panellists just to uh, briefly say what, what they see as being kind of the, the coming threat or, or what, what do business owners and, and managers need to be looking out for over the next 12 months or so uh, in order to, to protect their business. Uh, Graham, can I start with you? Yeah. Uh, so on our side, it's um, data integrity. So um, because now this data is sitting out on lots of people's laptops all, all over the place, um, it's if a person's updated uh, the, um, the information with um, uh, incorrect information or whatever the case is, and then that's utilized, or um, they've ended up bringing in a vulnerability, so making sure that the backup um, is, is, doesn't get infected and so forth and that. So one of the things that we're finding um, is um, how to keep the integrity of the data uh, while it's out there on everybody's machines. So people use antivirus and so forth, but we find more around input protection is the best policy of, of being able to control what's going on on those endpoints while the customer is, while the end user is out there. So uh, that's what we're focusing a lot more on, on on our side is how to keep that data, true data, whilst we have people using their own devices, for example. Great, thank you. Sarah? I would just summarize it really quickly is the risk of the human uh, working from home and I, I think that you know you've just got to consider that because uh, people do you know people do interesting things when left to their own devices so I think just considering that everybody's an individual and everybody's thinking differently and that you know they've got your data they've got your property what are they going to do with it and how are you going to make sure they do the right thing. Great. Nick? Yeah, okay, so I'm going to choose two if I'm allowed. But uh, so the first thing is perception. And I think there's a huge perception amongst SMB business leaders that it's not going to happen to them. Uh, hackers only care about the blue chip companies, which is just not the case. Statistically, I think it's 42 or 44% of all cyber attacks target SMB. So it can happen to you, it probably just won't make the news. So it could happen. And secondly, is if you haven't been hacked yet and you don't offer, uh, currently offer anything around the people space, is you've got an opportunity to be proactive and get ahead of the game and make that investment before uh, a potential compromise. Great. Henry? Yeah, I think mine's fairly straightforward. And it goes back to what I said before, that 90% of threats come via email. So. If you're sitting on the webinar now and thinking, oh, well, we've never done a, a scan of our inbox or we haven't got an email security or we've never rate, spoken about the type of threats that might come via email, that should change now. Um, raise awareness within your workforce. Again, whether it's you've got one person, two people, 2,000 people, raise awareness within your workforce about email security and the threats that can come via email because that is where you are most likely will be infiltrated if you are. And the, I, I could, I'd be put, would put a lot of money on right now that every single person on the webinar will have at least one phishing email in their inbox. And the reason I say that is because we scan hundreds of inboxes every single day. We did one yesterday. I got the stats here. We scanned 2,000 inboxes and we found 462 threats that are in the inbox. So that's not stopped. They're sat in people's inboxes. And if they click on the links, 
they've got a chance that the network will be infiltrated. So raise email security awareness within the organization and continue to do it on a regular basis because that's where the biggest threat is. Great. Well, I, you know, I think uh, time's fl flown by, but we've covered an awful lot of, of really interesting uh, material. And I, I know as a, as a business owner, there's a, there's a long list of stuff been scrolled down on my notepad that, that we need to uh, look at and, and, and think about. Uh, and I, I hope uh, everybody who's been listening in uh, has found that as useful. Uh, this will be followed up on, on the businessdesk.com over the next uh, day or so. Uh, with uh, highlight clips from the from the webinar, as well as the opportunity to replay the webinar. So if you want to share it with with colleagues and, and suppliers uh, who you think might be interested, uh, but that's all for this morning. So uh, thank you, Nick, Graham, Henry, and Sarah for for your contributions, uh, and hope you all uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>